And I'm excited to announce that we have interpretation in several languages to tonight. And I'm going to ask each interpreter to explain how to access interpretation in their language. We'll start with Chinese. Hi, 你好,欢迎来到这个公共健康社区。如果您要需要这个国语的协助的话,在我们介绍完下面之后,会有一个纽,然后您在上面按这个中文纽,您就可以进到那里听中文了。谢谢您,然后也有欢迎您的问题提,
Uh, each will start with a brief opening remarks, and then we will go to question and answer. Um, before we do that, uh, I do have a couple of requests. Um, given. So uh, the Russian interpreter is speaking over, so I'm having a hard time hearing. Thank you for muting. Thank you. Okay, I think we're good. Thank you, Cindy. Um, so before we get started, I do have a request if you're planning on submitting questions this evening, um, due to the unprecedented interest in this topic, uh, we do want to accommodate as many questions as we can. Um, and as such, I would like to ask that if you do submit a question, uh, you try to keep it brief and to the point. Uh, if you submit a longer question, I will do my best to uh, encapsulate the spirit of your question, but I may need to shorten it or summarize it. Um, so in other words, if you send me a manifesto, please make sure it has a really good topic sentence because I may not be able to read the whole thing. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bielinson and Dr. Kasirier. Uh, Dr. Bielinson, we'll start with you. Dr. Bielinson, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think the Russian uh, interpretation is overtaking. Well, we have a, a busier day to a busier time right now than we've had in the past uh, six or so of these events. And so it's going to take a little while to go over these two issues. One is the regional stay at home order, which was just put out today by the governor. And the second is how, how immunizations are going to be tried out. And then Olivia will fill in for all the things that I miss. And, um, and then we'll go to questions and answers. So first of all, as we always start off with the number of cases, there are 40,305 cases. That is 1,000 a day. We're about 1,000 a day. That, that, that is um, up from 70 a day just about four or five weeks ago. So a huge increase from where we were, where we almost at orange for Halloween. We're now deep purple, if you will. Um, we are at 8.4% on the test positivity rate, which is up from about 3.2 or 2.4 or something, again, just a few weeks ago. And we are now at our peak in terms of hospitalizations, 359. That's more than we had back in May, June, um, and July. And 76 are in the ICU. The regional stay-at-home order is based on five different regions in the state, Northern California, the Bay Area, Greater Sacramento, San Joaquin Valley, and Southern California, and is triggered when the region's projected ICU capacity meets 15%. Sacramento County right now is at 80, is at 16.1%. Um, so we are close to the borderline, but it, at, we're actually part of a larger region. Granted, the rest of the, popula the, rest of the region is much less populated but uh, th th we will probably hit the 15% um, marker in the next few days. What that means is the following. Um, it triggers the regional stay at home order and it, ban it closes indoor and outdoor playgrounds, indoor recreation facilities, hair salons and barber shops, personal care services, museums, zoos and aquariums, movie theaters, wineries, bars, family entertainment centers, card rooms, limited services, live audience, sports, and amusement parks. So a lot of what had been open is gonna be closed when, we're, when we trigger the 15% ICU capacity regional stay at home order. The regional stay at home order, by the way, lasts for three weeks at least. And if we go above, the, if we are do better in terms of our ICU capacity, it would be removed. If we don't, it will continue. The following sectors will have additional modifications um, if, they, if we go into regional stay at home. Number one is outdoor recreational facilities, retail, which will be at 20% of capacity, shopping centers, also 20% of capacity, hotels and lodging, restaurants, which will be only allowed to do takeout and pickup, um, or deliveries, expression will allow outdoor services only. Um, the following sectors will remain open. In addition, they are critical infrastructure, schools that are already open for in-person learning. Let me be clear about that. Right now, we have some schools that have opened in the county, either because of a waiver for elementary schools or in general for the other schools because they came online when we were in the red tier. If a school has already started in person, it may continue. If it has not started in person, it may not start until we go back in the red. Um, Non-urgent medical and dental care will also continue to be used. 
and child care and pre-K will continue. Um, all obviously with masking, physical distancing. Um, Olivia, do you want to add anything to that? I think you've, you've covered it pretty well. There are probably going to be a lot of questions. So, right. so we'll, we'll have a lot of questions, but let me give you um, another little briefing. This is on the, the good news, if you will. So we'll, we'll bridge from bad news to good news. The bad news is, as now, as you can tell, we're in the midst of a surge, which started with the Halloween um, gatherings and has clearly continued with Thanksgiving Day gatherings from people outside of people's households. We're not anywhere near done with the Thanksgiving surge yet. And with the holidays coming up, <clears throat> um, including New Year's and, and Christmas and Hanukkah, and et cetera, et cetera, um, there'll be a lot of gatherings as well. So we're quite confident, unfortunately, that we'll continue to have a surge. And we'll stay in the purple tier, I would argue, probably until mid-January or so. The, the bad, so that's the bad news. The somewhat good news is we can try and bend the curve as we did in Sacramento County initially by doing things like staying home, um, not gathering with people outside of your household, masking and social distancing, period. If we can do that for six weeks, we can bend the curve. That bridges us to the good news, which is the last part of what I'm gonna talk about, which is that the vaccines are coming, they're on the horizon, they're on the near horizon, and light is at the end of the tunnel. We just have to get there. So there are, it can be broken down into many groups, but I'll break them down into three or four groups as to how people will be getting immunized. The first, immun first vaccines will be available by two, and about two weeks from now, two weeks from now and medical, frontline medical workers and nursing home patients will be amongst those who can get the, the initial 20 million um, vaccinations. There are 40 million um, vaccines, but 20 million um, vaccinations because you need two shots about 21 to 28 days apart, depending on what vaccination you get. So the first vaccinations will be in December and January. Additional vaccines will become available and in March and April, I'm sorry, in February and March and maybe April, we'll have people who have underlying health conditions, older people, particularly those 75 and older and those at most at risk besides the first group who are serious disease. By April, May, June, we should have enough on hand to be able to start, start and probably complete um, serving virtually all people um, in the community for uh, who want a vaccine. Let me close by saying, and then we'll take tons of questions, I'm sure, that logistically, I'm not terribly concerned about being able to do the vaccinations as a health department. We do them all the time for the flu, granted not as much as we do and as we will be doing in COVID, but there are, there are volunteers, all sorts of groups that are helping us, the National Guard, our great public health staff will be doing the work. Um, it will also be available at pharmacies, at hospitals, at doctor's offices, et cetera. So logistically, I'm not so concerned about getting the vaccine to people. What I am concerned about is the uptake of the vaccine, how, re how reticent people will be to not get, to get the vaccine. Uh, most recent polls have showed 50 to 55% of people would get the vaccine. That is not anywhere near enough to get to herd immunity, which is where we need to be, to be able to get back to a sense of real normalcy in the, in the community and in the country. So we're gonna have to work very hard to get those groups that are reticent to, to um, support vaccinations, particularly those gonna be vulnerable populations, um, impoverished folks, uh, others who would, who would normally be reticent to get a uh, vaccine because of things like the Tuskegee um, study in the past. And the other group will be those who have language difficulties. Um, now the second, both of those two groups actually are already overly affected and overly, um, are more severely affected by COVID than the regular than the general population. So we're gonna to have to make a real effort to get to those folks and with, with people of, of um, real standing in those different communities. So let me stop there and I'm gonna turn over to Olivia if she has anything to add and then um, we can take questions. I think we can go to questions. So just a reminder, you can submit your questions in the Q&A function um, on Zoom here. And we'll start with this one. Um, Dr. Bielenson touched a little bit on concerns about gatherings for the holidays. Obviously, we just came off of the Thanksgiving holiday and we have more 
celebrations coming up later this month. Um, what kind of recommendations can you give people as we head into those? Lydia. Well, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll be very brief. Um, and the governor said it today, no indoor gatherings aside from people who are in your own household, um, masks, social distancing, and if you're gonna be outside, limit the number of people and have social distancing and wear masks. Thank you. Um, we had a question about um, how the stay at home order affects restaurants. I know you touched a little bit on this in the opening, but um, can you clarify the impact on restaurants? Yeah, so um, and Olivia will get in in a second here. Sorry to, to hog things. Um, the restaurants are allowed to do takeout delivery only. They are not allowed to do um, indoor or outdoor dining. Um, and the restaurants were actually highlighted by the governor in his press conference for being very proactive and trying to help out the um, situation. We have a question about schools. Um, specifically, this person notes that their uh, school has a plan published uh, for remaining open and it appears to list teacher and staff monitoring testing as voluntary. With positive cases increasing as rapidly as they are, will there be a requirement for teachers or staff to be tested regularly going forward? Um, regardless of the level of positivity or, or the number of cases, uh, testing remains voluntary. We do try to make it available and try to provide education, um, but it will still remain uh, voluntary. We have a question here about uh, homelessness. With, with the limitations of hospitals and the huge increases in numbers, why are unhoused still being moved around? Can we tighten the health order to protect all shelter in place? We have grave concerns that multiple camps are being moved in areas with high numbers. Yeah, let me take a first stab at this. Um, there have been homeless advocates and others throughout this whole issue. And so we've, we've carefully crafted the um, health order, uh, Olivia has quite carefully crafted the health order to make sure we're protecting the rights of the um, un unhoused. That includes being able to stay in, in public, public areas, um, it, that they're allowed to keep their life necessities. You can't just take away all their stuff. And as long as they stay back from the curbs, et cetera, and don't impede the, the, the um, right away, they're allowed to stay as well. Um, we had a very un untoward incident today where the, um, the, the police came in and, and it did kind of a lightning strike and shut down an entire uh, encampment. Um, unfortunately, before a lot of us were notified and the police had told people that they were told that it was okay to do so by us, which it wasn't. Um, but we are working to try and protect people in the encampments and more importantly, actually, in many ways, is trying to get people from the encampments into things like tough sheds, um, little houses, stuff like that, that you'll hopefully be hearing about in the near future. Another question about schools. If the Sacramento region is on a stay-at-home order, will schools still be allowed to host extracurricular drive-in events following the drive-in event guidance that was issued locally on August 24th? Schools frequently partner with local community organizations for holiday distributions. Uh, will this be allowed for food and or presents? Well, definitely for food dis distribution, those activities will be still be allowed. Um, but as for other driving events, we do have a process in Sacramento where uh, individuals or groups can put in an application um, for an event that they're planning and it is reviewed by a team. And then we will send um, a decision whether it's approved or not. I know that now with the um, stay at home order, some of the ones that we had approved before uh, were being asked if, if they will still be allowed. So we are reevaluating them. This question asks, um, are dental offices and some doctor appointments covered under personal services? In other words, will these be shut down again? 
No, they won't. A non-urgent medical and non-urgent dental are allowed. And by personal services, they're basically uh, referring to things like uh, barbershops, hair, nail, um, but it, den dental is covered under healthcare. Another uh, question about homelessness asking uh, if we're working on opening more uh, project room keys or sheltering for our homeless community. We had um, several hotels open with, I can't remember which one was room key and which one was the other key thing. Home um, key. But what? Home key. The other one is home key. Home key, which is a, mis a mistake that they confuse them. Uh, anyway, uh, initially we were getting people into the hotels um, from the streets and that worked quite well. We had very few cases of, of um, COVID in our homeless folks. Um, what we're trying to do now, if we can, is to get people um, into new hotels or new uh, buildings, um, or new, newly uh, renovated buildings uh, that we've not been as successful in. Okay, another school question. Um, so some schools that were not uh, fully open for in-person instruction have been operating uh, learning hubs or other on-campus learning groups. Will those be allowed to continue? Yes, um, as much as possible, the school activities will be uh, able to continue. Uh, schools that had already opened will be able to continue and we will still be able to review um, applications for the waiver. Question asks if you could talk a little more about what activities are driving the huge increase in cases. Besides gathering, what are the other high risk activities? Gatherings. I mean, it's the contact tracers, which we use as well as the electronic contact tracer called Qualtrics basically. It's allowed, is able to keep up with the, the cases. And although we don't have a large number of them are not necessarily, we don't know exactly where they came from. The biggest concern is, is gatherings and nursing homes. So I know our office had a lot of interest in uh, this today um, with the announcements uh, from the governor's office. What percentage of COVID ICU patients are occupying uh, IC be ICU beds in the greater Sacramento region? What kind of a... So in the greater Sacramento region, I don't know for sure, I'll ask Olivia, but if we, mm -hmm. we look at our dashboard for Sacramento County, we're at 83.9% full. So we're very, very close to that 15%. Right, we are Right, but the state will have to, we'll have to wait for the state to give us the, um, what the figure is for the greater Sacramento region and um, probably that will be out tomorrow and they have stated that they will update this twice a week. Um, but what we know from the pro initial projections that uh, they gave us is that we're expected to hit the 15% uh, uh, threshold. Um, around the 15th for uh, earlier. A couple more vaccine questions here. Uh, first, uh, what does it mean that the Moderna vaccine causes antibodies that endure for three months? Does that mean that people need boosters after three months? That's a good question. They don't know too much about the um, vaccines yet. Uh, because they're actually approving them under an emergency use authorization, which requires less proof, less um, powerful proof. We can say that the vaccines appear to be about 95% effective. One's 94, one's 94.5, sorry, one's 95 and one is 90 or so. Um, so they're quite effective. How long they, um, how long they cause a, um, antibodies to be produced for is, is in question. Um, and the most of them so far require two shots again, 21 to 28 days apart. Um, so I would imagine that they have, I, I, I don't know for sure, but I would imagine that Moderna is, is better than three months. That would be not terribly helpful. Olivia, do you know anything about that? Um, no, I agree with what you said. Um, I think there's still a lot that we're learning, but I would imagine that it should be for more than three months. 
along those same lines, we have a question about uh, whether a vaccine would be required annually to be effective. Don't know yet. You guys like to talk a little bit about whether outdoor tennis and pickleball games can continue. <laughs> Olivia. Um, we're still uh, working out some of those details. We know that from what the governor said that he is encouraging people to spend time outdoors, such as walking and engaging in activities that don't lead to gatherings or mixing from different households. But uh, those details about the different games, uh, um, I think those are the details that we have to work out the next couple of days. Along those lines, there's a question about uh, data for disease transmission and outdoor activities, restaurants, playgrounds, et cetera, and whether there's a place where the public can access uh, information on that. I'm not sure exactly what that question is. What, what are they asking for? They're asking for data about disease transmission in outdoor restaurants, playgrounds, et cetera. So. Basically what they're saying is contact tracing, what we have found related to those. Um, I, I don't think that our data is able to parse it to that level um, because we have a number of questions that we ask and usually it's based on trying to find out who the person was around and also about gatherings and restaurants so um, or if they were engaged in things like um, sports but otherwise for playgrounds I we will not have that level of, of detail. And I'm not sure what the um, research shows. I know that um, I think some of the studies indicated that playgrounds were pretty safe and that's the reason why the state uh, revised the, the, the order to allow for playgrounds to be open, out, outdoor playgrounds. Sure. We have a, another question about sure, schools. The question is, are you working with Sacramento County Office of Education? And if so, what is the criteria for reopening schools other than being in the red tier? We've done, uh, Olivia has spent a huge amount of time with, with Dave Gordon, as have I, who's the head of SCOE and working with the 13 different districts. Olivia. Um, we're, we're following the, the state guidelines. And right now um, it's based on the being in the red tier. But for those schools that were able, able to reopen, uh, when we were in the red tier, they're able to remain open. And then also we do have the waiver process for elementary school, which is not based on a tier process. Another question about athletics. Uh, what about indoor athletic facilities such as indoor tennis courts? No, not with a stay at home order, no. Um, will there be a charge for the vaccine? It's free. Uh, yes, it's all being supplied by the feds and the state. So we will not be charging for the vaccinations. Okay, um, here we have a question about government offices. Uh, are government offices in the city of Sacramento expected by the county health department to return to telework? Uh, those employees whose positions were able to telework through the spring and summer specifically interested in state department and state agencies, in particular non-uniformed office employees and law enforcement agencies. Um, could you repeat that question? It's a, uh, what exactly yeah. are you asking? So uh, the question is, I think, trying to get at uh, what will be the expectation for um, office employees uh, either working in the office versus teleworking it is very dependent on the type of work that the person does. But in general, our advice to employers is that as much as possible <clears throat> that anybody who is able to telework does so at this time because it will and make it easier for you to um, maintain the six feet of separation between workers and also reduce the risk of transmission, reduce any um, 
exposures or having to have people go home because they were exposed. A question about uh, outdoor youth sports. Any new information on that? Right now, the information we have is that definitely games are not permitted at this time. We did ask about the sports conditioning and um, for confirm for clarification. We um, have to implement the state order. Okay, we have a question about grocery shopping. Um, how long is it safe to be inside a grocery store considering the degree of spread right now? 12 minutes and 37 seconds. No, just kidding. Um, there's, there's no particular safe time. I mean, for, those, for example, if you go in wearing a mask and socially distancing, you can be there for 55 minutes. If you go in with a mask that's down over your nose and you don't socially distance, you should be there for less than one. It really matters on what you do. If you follow the rules, of socially distancing and almost all grocery stores now have the, the round stickers that show you where you should stand and you wear a mask, which is absolutely imperative. Um, it shouldn't be terribly dangerous. One thing that helps also is uh, planning ahead so that you minimize the amount of time that you are in the store. Uh, make sure that you have your list you are able to get in and out quickly. Um, I know that some people have also, especially for those who are in the um, age groups that, that are highest at risk or age over 65, or those with chronic conditions, either they're able to make use of um, the special hours. Some of the stores provide special hours for older people, especially early morning or late evening. And then also there are some other services like curbside uh, pickup is very um, efficient and, uh, and also um, minimizes your having to go in and out of, of stores. And also of course, being able to have it delivered to your home. Okay, um, do we know of any anticipated changes to childcare? Child care is still permitted? No, the answer is no, we don't. Okay, as a uh, avid traveler myself, I get a lot of these emails. This question is, what makes flying in an airplane low risk as they are claiming in their ads? Well, they talk about HEPA filters and things like that. And I don't, I don't know enough about that to know if it's, that's that true. I can say though, and Olivia, correct me if I'm wrong, that we have not seen a lot related to, at least since the um, initial outbreaks in um, Asia and in Europe that brought um, some of the cases here. Um, I don't think we have seen a large number, if any, um, cases that have been transmitted on airplane trips. Um, part, part of that is probably because they require um, a, a mass and, and they have space between, pay, between um, passengers um, and I think the air filtering probably does have something to do with it, but I don't think we have seen very many cases actually, Olivia. Agreed. Hey, uh, this question is how will the African American community access the vaccine? We are an especially hard hit community. So one, um, uh, well, go ahead, Olivia. Yeah, um, that is a good question. And actually this is for all of the um, minority groups and disadvantaged communities. We are going to take special effort to ensure that um, we're able to provide vaccine. One good thing that we have in Sacramento is that when we were um, deciding on sites for our testing, um, community testing sites, we were looking at disadvantaged communities and communities that um, had higher numbers. So being able to look at that, uh, one of the thoughts we have is actually when it comes around to um, the community uh, vaccination clinics is that we can easily work with the same sites to provide the vaccine. So that will be one way 
Um, we're also looking at other ways, um, especially for those that are not very mobile, uh, those that um, are maybe uh, not able to get out of their house or are in uh, board and care facilities, we will have uh, small teams that we call strike teams that will be able to uh, go to some of these places to be able to um, provide the vaccine. And that's the same for the homeless as well. All right, uh, this question is about if we hit the, uh, the threshold for the shutdown order, will beauty and nail salons be able to stay open outside? No, those, all of those will be shut. Will Sacramento County consider mandatory mask requirements? We already have one. All right, uh, Sacramento is about to finish a $350 million new convention center. With the vaccine coming out, when do you think small and large meetings would be able to happen again? My guess is probably in middle of summer. Um, that's just an educated guess, but based on when people be immunized by and the amount of, of uh, capacity that we'll have to immunize people, and assuming that they get enough, if we, that we have enough people who take it up for, to get herd immunity, I would say probably by mid to late summer. Olivia, what's your guess? That's a good, a good guess, I think. I'm writing that down and holding you to it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't buy your tickets yet. <laughs> Um, will the vaccine be mandatory? What about for educators or child care workers? Um, from all the information we have right now, uh, we will depend a lot on uh, being able to educate people and encourage them to take the vaccine. There are no plans to have any mandates for vaccination this time. Right. Um, and we talked a little bit earlier about uh, medical and dental appointments uh, along those same lines. Somebody uh, says they're currently undergoing physical therapy. And would this be allowed to continue? As far as I know, yes. For the same reason that uh, that not, uh, that um, non-urgent dental and, and medical offices are open. Another vaccine question, uh, how would side effects to the shots be reported for evaluation? Through, is it V-A-E-R-S, um, Olivia? There's a, yes. there's, a system, there's a system that's already set up by the federal government that collects um, reports of adverse um, events. So there is that already. All right, we're going to test your memory on this one. Um, do either of you recall what the ICU capacity was during our July surge? It's about 500, and we're at about 425 now in terms of ICU beds that have been taken up. So that's why we're about 85%. Do you it, it, recall it, where, it, where we were in July? It was, it's about the same. It's about five, it's between 460 to 550, somewhere in there at all times. That's for ICU beds now. There's surge capacity beds that are another four or 500, of which we're only using a few. Have there been many cases reported that can be traced back to shopping in retail stores? That is difficult to, to be able to track back. The only times we would be able to uh, track an infection to a store is or people who work in the stores, but otherwise, um, I think that's difficult. Decided that someone's dog is barking and it's not mine. No, it's mine. All right. <laughs> um, this question asks, uh, when gatherings seem to be cited for the spread of the virus, why are restaurants and small businesses the fall guys, especially after following the modified operational rules and protocols for mitigation? So we've been arguing that with the state for quite a while. Olivia has taken it to the state. We, I've taken it to the state. We've met with the restaurateurs many times. Um, the point is quite well taken. 
about 7.1% of the cases that we know about are in um, restaurant industry, which is not a huge percentage considering how many restaurants there are. Um, so our, our, our um, point has been that they are pretty good actors and that they probably are being made the fall guy to some extent. Um, but right now is not the time to really make the huge argument since we're going into the stay at home order period. Although they are allowed to do takeout and delivery. Another vaccine question. Uh, will it be given to those who are recovering or have previously had COVID? Yes, it will, but they will, they would be bounced. So for example, my mom is 86. She had COVID. She developed antibodies back in the spring. She would actually be down lower on the um, rankings of people to get shots. In other words, because she has had it and has, has antibodies, she will get the shot, but she would get it less, um, less acutely, if you will. So uh, here's a question about how we will be able to handle the new Cal OSHA emergency regulation uh, that was issued on November 30th of this year. Um, specifically, it notes at businesses with an outbreak of three positive staff exposures, employees will need to test weekly until the workplace achieves 14 days without a positive test. Are any changes expected to emergency regulation if testing at that level won't be available? I think that the difficulty is being able to make that level of testing available at all of the workplaces. Do we know of any changes upcoming for evictions, business closures, et cetera? Uh, the city has, a, has a, an ordinance against that and I believe the county does as well. We talked earlier about uh, physical therapy. This question is about therapeutic massage. Um, is that permitted? At this point, I don't know. Those are some of the details that we will have to find out. Right. This person notes that they uh, were tested for COVID uh, over a week ago and they're waiting on the results. They have no symptoms, but they were exposed to someone two weeks ago. They have been isolating. How long do they need to isolate when they do not have results and they are asymptomatic? If they've been, so, go ahead. I was just gonna say it's surprising that they've, it's been a week and they don't have results because at least in Sacramento, the turnaround time has been well within the 48 to 72 hour period. So my thought is that they need to find out um, what could have changed or, or where, you know, where, where the, um, they need to call wherever they, they went to get their, their uh, test done and find out what has happened because um, that's a little too long. But in general, we do ask that if someone is awaiting a test result, that they do wait and go on a quarantine until they get those results back. So I think the first thing for that person is to find out where their results are. Are non-essential stores such as gift shops, bookstores, toy stores going to need to close? Retail can be at 20% of capacity. Um, and I would, I would um, interpret that as allowing it. This is not just shopping malls, but retail. Yeah, that's 20%. What considerations are used to determine how much vaccine uh, local health, health systems such as Kaiser, Sutter, UCD, and Dignity are given? There's a, there's a whole system of um, state people and, and a, um, a uh, group of folks who make the decisions based on what, what the populations are and what minority populations there are and what separate needs are of each of the jurisdictions. Um, but there's a, a well-oiled planning machine that is working on that. And it should be very, it's fairly transparent in addition like the information that I gave earlier about who's going to um, get vaccines when is, is part of the national plan and it's, it's a pretty, um, pretty open.
right? How can public servants, teachers, who statistically are more likely to transmit the disease than young children not be compelled to get tested? If I have to vaccinate my children to send them to school, the teachers should be getting tested even now since many are on campus. This is insanity. Um, I'm not sure whether that was a question or a statement. Maybe both. I think they're asking uh, why teachers are not being required to, to get tested. Uh, that it's only voluntary. Well, right now it's it's the same with um, there's no, it's still voluntary for everybody to get tested. I know that uh, there's more testing that's being done in some places like the long-term care facilities, but it's still a voluntary process. Another vaccine question. Uh, this person's wondering how long until we know the long-term effects of the new vaccine, how long it's effective, whether we'll need repeat vaccines annually, et cetera. My guess is through one cycle of the um, vaccinations, um, the EUA, the uh, EUA, which would be approved, they already had to go through phase one and phase two studies that have had a decent number of people, not tons, but like 40,000 people that have, been, that have been getting the vaccine. And so you would expect severe, um, you'd expect some common side effects to at least be showing up, maybe not the most severe, rare, rare, rare ones. But I would argue that after the first um, cycle, this, this first year of, of immunizations, we'll know much more about how long lasting they are, if there are any side effects, et cetera. I don't think there are going to be major side effects, though, from what I've seen. On October 26, Sacramento County Public Health published COVID-19 reopening guidance for schools, um, and it included a decision tree. The question is, uh, will that decision tree change based on CDC's recently updated quarantine changes uh, from 14 days to shorter uh, quarantine period? We're still reviewing that and also uh, talking with the, the state so that we make sure that if there are any changes that they're consistent across the board. So you don't have one county making it 10 and another keeping it 14. So uh, we will update once we get uh, some guidance from the state on that. If gyms are closed under stay at home, why they continue they contribute to health and stress reduction is there any data to show they are a risk they're the other group that we've been pushing particularly fitness studios that have room between people and they can they can have appointments scheduled but that was to no avail with the, with the state and again um, they're right there have not been a lot of cases related to uh, gyms and fitness studios that we know of Person notes, my massage therapist said they are required to close even though it is part of my physical therapy. Does a massage therapist have to be licensed as a physical therapist? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's something that we would take back. And um, if they can email us, we can uh, check back and make sure. The note, you can email us at covid19 at sacccounty.net. Um, any contraindication with COVID vaccines and medications or medical conditions that we know of? Not that I know of now. All right, this question uh, is about sleep train. Can we use sleep train arena for ICU? Um, actually, no, not for the ICU, but they will be used for less severe cases, both COVID and non-COVID. They have 225 beds that will be open probably by the next uh, two or three weeks by December 9th, they're opening the first 20 beds, I think it is. And again, it could be COVID patients or non-COVID patients, but not ICU type patients. They'd be in the hospital. Right, Olivia? Right. Okay, uh, what can or should employees who are afraid of unnecessary risk of exposure do when their employer notifies them on Monday of two positive cases last week in the workplace and four cases just today. This in addition to the eight cases over a two week period last month, but the employer won't let the office workers go back to telework. I think that's an issue that um, would best be handled if they can 
either work with their HR or if there are still concerns, call our office and work with our public health nurses. Do we know the current demographics of hospitalizations and ICU admissions? Yes, but I, I don't have that handy right now. What about churches? Are they on limited capacity or are services not allowed? They are only allowed to have outdoor services and to stay in the stay at home order. Do we have any statistics on positive cases uh, who get tested without any symptoms or are all positive cases from symptomatic people? Um, I don't have the percentages, but uh, yes, we, we do test both those with symptoms and those without symptoms. And there are those who are those who without symptoms, there are plenty of positives. Can you uh, talk a little bit more about when the vaccine will be widely available to the community? So it'll be available, at least um, Pfizer's and Moderna's most likely will be available in the late, in mid to late December. Um, again, at relatively limited doses, I think that one of them will have 40 million doses, which gives 20,000, I'm sorry, 40 million vaccine immunization, whatever they're called, and that they have to get two shots. So it's worth 20 million people. Um, they think that the first 20 million will cover nursing home patients and the vast majority of frontline healthcare workers, that's, which is why they're getting it in December and January. Then, then, then they speed up pr production and there'll be additional vaccines, most likely. There's probably a couple more, or at least that are on their way, that will increase the number of the capacity of um, immunizations in um, February, March, and April, and then there'll be a large amount available for the next three months. That's where the, the dates come from. There's a question about whether this will be recorded. I believe these are all recorded and then they're posted to the Sacramento County YouTube page. All right, uh, this one says, I think Dr. Bielenson touched on this earlier, but how fast are cases rising now compared to in the summer months? Huge. Um, if, yeah, if you look at um, our uh, dashboard, uh, we do have a chart in there that shows how quickly uh, cases are going up and you can see that the slope is steeper than it was in July and we have exceeded the uh, tip of the, uh, the surge that we had in July. You can find it at Sacramento COVID-19. If you put in Sacramento COVID-19, it'll pop up. Another question about Jim it says they've moved outdoors and online. Will they need to close outdoor operations? Um, I'm checking on that. I, yeah, I'm looking to. I don't see it. Yeah, we'll have to check on that. Yeah. We have another uh, school question. I know some schools have teachers and staff on campus, even if the school has not reopened uh, for in-person instruction, will they be allowed to continue to do that? Will they be able to continue? Uh, will schools be allowed to continue having teachers or staff work on campus even if they have not reopened for in-person instruction? So some schools have teach, uh, teachers yes. teaching from their classrooms remotely. Yes. What about football? No. Um, so football, well, football, depending on what, what um, level of football, pro football is obviously happening with no fans. College football is happening with no fans. High school football is not allowed. Um, I would argue that football is a, as a contact sport is like a, the most contacting of all contact sports. And so people are on top of each other and they're breathing without a mask and it's quite dangerous. That being said, in answer to the question earlier in the discussion, um, I think by football season this coming year, um, you know, when, in August and September, we will be able to be at enough of a state of normalcy that they'll be able to have at least some, if not all crowds. 
at high school, at high school, college, and federal pro. Okay. Uh, does the county count all positive tested people in the hospital as COVID cases, even if they went in for a broken arm and have no symptoms? We get that question all the time. And I just want to assure you that, um, and especially when it comes to the deaths, we have uh, a definition for cases, a definition for deaths, and um, we actually, for those in the hospital, we also get the records and so are able to review them. Let me, let me take a stab at this real quickly because I think this is coming from a position of that people, or at least it may have been that people don't think there's a, a big enough problem with COVID to be made, to be justifying what's happening. We have a huge problem now, 275,000 people have died. There's 10 to 30% of those who got COVID, whether it was se severe or not, who end up with long-term consequences, blood clotting disease, heart, lung, fatigue, um, brain fog, all sorts of things that are going to be long-term effects. And we're getting now getting a surge with tons and tons of hospitalizations and ICU visits all across the country. This is really serious, and we have to deal with this for the next several weeks and bend the curve in order to, pre to prevent unnecessary hospitalizations and unnecessary deaths. Okay, another one we're going to ask you to place your bets here. How long of a shutdown should we prepare for across uh, the city, the state, and the region? Well, the, the one that we're under now? Yeah, a minimum of three weeks. Yeah, but uh, that, if you got to take a guess, I'm going to say it's going to be more like six weeks. So you're saying we should buy more toilet paper? Yeah, if it's available. But remember, the stores are open. Those sto grocery stores and, and those kinds of stores are open. So please don't go buying all this stuff. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Uh, so the county doesn't ask where people have been during contact tracing. Can you please clarify? What was that? The, uh, the question is, uh, the, it says, so the county does not ask where people have been during contact tracing. Can you please clarify? I think this might be a follow up because some of the questions previously were asking about, you know, are we able to say for certain how many cases come from retail or a playground? Um, so maybe you could just talk a little more about the contact tracing process and um, Yes, they do ask where people have been, but again, you're looking at a two week period. So sometimes it's very difficult to pin exactly where someone may have been exposed. Um, it's easier if you're able to determine that they were at a gathering or that they um, have other people that they know who are positive. But otherwise, from our contact tracing, we do ask those questions, but in about 50% of the cases, we're not able to track back to where the exposure could have occurred. We have a question about churches. They're asking uh, if the criteria for churches will change with the new order and follow up, why is the outdoor capacity max based on the indoor capacity currently in Sacramento County? That was a judgment call based on um, trying to balance uh, the need for uh, churches or actually re religious organizations to be able to have their services, but at the same time uh, prevent uh, large groups of people being in one place. And this, the county is allowed to have, uh, to have additional restrictions um, to the state guidance. Are gymnastics clubs permitted to continue practicing? No. no. Not no. All right. I walk by a park daily. There are children and adults in groups not wearing masks. There are people waiting to play on the courts without distancing and no mask wearing. No mask wearing when playing on the tennis court. What is the plan for enforcement of the state guidelines under the state order and is the county hotline going to remain available? 
So Olivia and I have been working on this ordinance now for three or four, well, actually for longer, several weeks, because we're quite concerned about some small number of businesses and people who gather who have been kind of flaunting the rules. Um, we have a number 311 that people can call to report conditions that are unsafe or they think are unsafe. Um, I, I will be very honest with you that um, because the sheriff is not, is refusing to um, enforce any of the laws related to COVID, that hamstrings us to a large extent because obviously they have people out and about 24 seven and they have thousands of people that they can go, that can go to people's houses if there's a, a report of a gathering going on or a party going on that we cannot do as well. We will sort of use public health staff who already are doing things to enforce, to do the enforcement and the fining, which will be allowed to do under this ordinance if it passes. Um, but I, I should be clear about a couple of things. First of all, we always, always educate first when we go to a restaurant or we go to a, a, a bar, or we go to a grocery store or wherever that is not following the rules, not wearing masks, et cetera. Um, and then we do um, a lot of follow-up with business navigators to help folks understand why they have to do what, they, what we're asking them to do. And only if they continue to flaunt the rules, will we, will we pick out people who will be bad actors that we want to um, find to make an, an example of. That'll include people who are doing um, uh, gathering because we, it's not so much the businesses as the gatherings. Um, I also uh, do want to point out that um, we do have limited resources. So we are to the large extent dependent on businesses to enforce the orders. And so businesses being able to, they're required actually in order to be open to have protocols in place for uh, masking and social distancing. Um, so we're still dependent on them to a large extent, the enforcement. Dr. Bielinson, this one might be for you. Are there any restrictions or concerns with dog grooming? With dog grooming? Um, yes, we have dog grooming. Um, they were originally allowed to bring them to their fence and hand them over. I think they can still do that, right? Is that personal services, Olivia? It's doggy it's services. services. Yes. Uh, so it may be prohibited at this time uh, when we have the stay at home order, I guess. Sorry, dog groomers. All right. This question is particularly relevant for my sister who keeps her mail in her garage for two weeks after the rides. Can people stop wiping down items they purchase when they get home? Yes, yes, yes. So th <clears throat> this is where a lot of the, um, Information has changed over time as we learn much more about this disease. It is an aerosolized, airborne um, disease that has passed through, through breathing on people or coughing on people, which is why masks on both sides of the aisle, uh, both sides of the, pe the people on both sides of an interaction should have masks and be at least six feet away. Actually, if you sneeze or whatever, it, puts it, it pushes it out further, um, but you've got to have that what we, what we have found is that fomites, which are surfaces that can have bacteria or viruses on them, um, initially show that they actually, the virus lasted a fair amount of time on the fomites. Um, but as, as, as it's turned out, it quickly, quickly loses its um, capability of infection. And so the vast majority of infections are airborne. Very, very few of them are, hand, are um, surface related. And that's why it's kind of silly. I shouldn't probably say this, but all the um, stores around town are saying how much cleaning they're doing all the time. That probably is not that important. What is really important is wearing masks and, and social distancing and not gathering. We have a couple more uh, questions about the vaccine. Uh, first, when do we anticipate being able to vaccinate children? So children are in the th th third tier and they don't have approval yet. Yeah, um, right now, actually, children are not included. And then another question is, um, how are we going to keep track of those who have been vaccinated? Start there. We already have a system of the care system that uh, it's a state-based system that uh, tracks vaccinations. We use this on a routine basis for uh, children's vaccinations. 
and flu vaccine. So that is the system that will be used. But I am a little bit concerned because we're talking about two shots that people need. So let's say Peter Bielensen gets a shot on December 1st and he's scheduled for December 21st, so three weeks later um, when they're supposed to get the second dose. And it is re registered in the, in the state database. And so the database spits out, well, Peter Bielensen needs to get his second his shot. But finding Peter Bielensen, if he's transient, if he's um, an agricultural worker, if he's homeless or whatever, is going to be somewhat of a difficulty, which is why it's really good to have a one-shot vaccine, because in one shot, it's a lot easier. And there may be one or two uh, vaccines coming out that have a one-shot. Um, but Olivia is correct, of course, that that's the way that we keep track of it in the state. And it's just going to be a little bit more difficult than a single-shot uh, dose. And then one last uh, vaccine follow-up there. Would someone need to show the identification to receive the vaccine? It'll be the same process that you go through right now for being able to get vaccinated. Yes, you do have to show some form of vaccination. I mean, um, form of identification. Yeah, so we can keep track of where people live. And I know Dr. Bjornsson, you talked a little bit about this earlier, but what will happen if uh, we don't have enough people willing to take the vaccine? Then we won't have herd immunity. So herd immunity is what's considered when you have enough people that are immunized or prevented, uh, have prevention or are, um, are immune to the disease that if you come in contact with someone else, they're less likely to pass it on or whatever. Once you, when a, when a, um, a, a disease has a R naught, R, big R with a little number at the bottom of it, which is, I'm getting into too much detail, um, of greater than one. In other words, if everyone who, is, uh, who has the virus is exposed to people and one or more people get the virus from that folk, those folks, then it's growing. If it's lower than one, it's shrinking and you wanna get it exponentially lower. So you need to get a herd immunity of 70 plus percent in order to do that. I do think, though, that um, with the efforts and our ability to work with community-based agencies, that we'll be able to have a good outreach into those communities. And um, I think uh, some of the hesitation we are seeing uh, from individuals is because they're just not sure this is a very new vaccine. But as more and more people get vaccinated, and especially since we're starting with um, the healthcare community, and people realize that it is safe, it's okay, that I think that um, the uptick will, will take up. Um, and I'm thinking about this, uh, especially from the experience that we had with H1N1, because we did have some people who were very vocal in terms of saying they would not take the vaccine. But then uh, once it was made available, a lot of people did. So my thought is that after everyone sees how it's going, that more people will be willing to take it. And trusted messengers are going to be very important in each of those communities, the Asian Pacific Islander, African-American, Spanish speaking, and all the other, obviously they're not monolithic, all the other organizations. In addition to things like Bill Clinton or Barack Obama, and George Bush are, are gonna all get the shot to show people that it's safe. And so will you. <laughs> so will I, yes. All right, um, are casinos able to stay open? No. Um, casinos, the, the, uh, I think the challenge, because this is a question that the state was asked, they are controlled by the Native American tribes. Right. But there will be a strong recommendation that they close. Yeah, and any card rooms and other casinos that are not at Native American run are banned. I'm pretty sure, right, Olivia? Correct. Okay. And we can't go to Reno either, right? So, um, um, actually, that's, I, I just wanted to point out, I know we've talked a lot about the uh, stay at home order, but there was also a uh, travel ban that the state also um, in, uh, released today. Um, so that's something that people need to be aware of. 
any... what, does that, what does that mean, Olivia? Can we travel to Baltimore? Um, basically, any travel that is non-essential is strongly discouraged. I don't think that there'll be someone standing at the right. well, at the airport to stop you going, but uh, definitely they are. It's, it's it's you know it's strongly discouraged if it is not related to essential travel. Okay, this uh, sounds like a question from a, a, someone who works in a business. It has been said that face shields are not as effective as masks. How should retail handle situations where patrons indicate they cannot wear a face cover? Would you recommend that face shields be allowed? Yes. It's better than nothing for sure. And depending on how the face shield, the longer the face shield is, the more protection it gives, obviously. But a mask is better. Can you discuss how the exposure notification works with the iPhone and its effectiveness? Um, so that when a person signs up to get the test, they have the option of being able to opt in to the system. And also when we um, get the results, the results are also entered into the what we um, the software is called Qualtrics, and so this um, will then send a message, a text message to the person with the results, and they will have the option of entering additional information, answering questions about uh, where they could have been exposed and who their other contacts are who need to be followed up on. They will also have an option to be able to state if they need assistance to in order to be able to be compliant with the isolation order and they give an education about what isolation means. And there are three attempts that are made to contact the person and after that it will go to another system where someone else will call. Where will we find the critical care doctors and nurses to cover ICU surge beds in the community? Um, so there, there is a system of mutual assistance. So if one area, one state, one county has a need, they, we have a system where they can request additional uh, capacity or additional staffing uh, through Initially, it's the region, and then um, if, if the resource is not there at the region level, then it will be bumped up to the state and the federal government as well. But of course, um, if a large number of counties or if the entire region is experiencing a surge, you can imagine that there might be a lot of re requests going through, and so it might be more difficult to uh, be able to meet those requests. And that is the reason for the concern that the state has. And the fact that 51 counties right now are in the purple tier, and that for many of those counties, their intensive care unit capacity is close to that critical 15%. And when you look at the number of beds, um, that's just one criteria, but the other criteria is actually looking at yeah. this thing as well. Another hospital question here. What changes have been made to hospital emergency rooms over the past eight months to help mitigate the spread of the virus? Uh, that might be a question that is best answered by someone who works in the hospital emergency room, but for one thing I know that um, they do ask the question about symptoms of the, when you're checking in, so that if you have symptoms that of COVID-19, they will make sure that you're appropriately um, isolated, isolated from others and that uh, they're able to do the COVID testing quickly. Uh, the other, of course, is availability of um, personal protective equipment 
um, so that uh, the, the staff that are taking care of you can be protected as well. Uh, why is the positivity rate used to measure spread, severity, and the need for restrictions? Although there does seem to be a link, it seems like it would only be a good measure if we used random sampling. Um, the positivity rate is just one factor. Uh, there are a lot of other factors we look at, such as the case rate, such as hospitalization. Um, but of course, when you are trying to create a system, you do select a few indicators that could be easy for you to track so that it makes it easier to be able to make uh, decisions quickly. And uh, so it has been found that the positivity rate is a good indicator of the amount of spread in the community and that's why it's used. Okay, it looks like somebody wants to get you involved in a family disagreement here. Can you please reiterate that extended family should not get together for Christmas for those of us with family that are stubborn? They should absolutely positively not include anyone who is not in your household when you're coming for Christmas, period. Stay home. The one thing that we've been talking about again is related to what I was talking about at the very beginning. We are now in a period of time where what we're trying to do is, is actually um, harm reduction, reducing the harm to people over the next several weeks of unnecessary hospitalizations, unnecessary ICU, unnecessary long-term effects of COVID and unnecessary deaths until we get to the immunizations. So this is a one-year thing that everybody's having to deal with. We've made it through eight months so far. Let's just make it through one more month. Another vaccine question. I take a biologic drug which inhibits my immune system. Would that make the vaccine ineffective? Good question, I'm not sure. Right now we have not been given any uh, data on contraindications. I think those are questions that will definitely be asked. And another uh, vaccine question. Will antibody tests after the shots be available to see if the vaccination was effective? They, they may, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than that because there are specific antibodies for the virus and there are T cells which are kind of generalized antibodies, if you to simplify it. Um, and they're not sure which ones are the ones that work the most on the uh, virus. So I think we're gonna have to wait and see what the site, again, through a cycle to see exactly how the vaccine works, what kind of antibodies it produces, how long they last for, any side effects, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, we have a question about masks. What type of mask is best? And should I be wearing a mask in the car by myself and outside walking? And by yourself is a definite no. And right now there are a lot of different um, face coverings that are available. I think what's important to remember is that it should cover your nose and mouth. Um, and, and so, uh, as I mentioned, there are a lot of different ones that you can use. As far as walking outside, if you are basically outside by yourself and there's no one around, it's fine to have not have your mask on, but have it on you so that if you are passing someone else or if you're engaged in a conversation, you can pull it out and put it on. And the masks that are three layers that go like this, are, are better than one or two layers, if you can find them. And they're also better than gaiters. Gaiters are not supposed to be that terribly effective. Other than following the public health guidelines, what can community members do to support needs in the area? Needs. What is that? What, is it, what do you mean? I don't know. Well, we'll skip the question then. <laughs> All right. Um, what is the availability of in-home or school saliva testing? We don't have that available right now. Uh, 
All right, we have a question from a Starbucks operator. Uh, they want to know if they will need to close the store or just limit how many people they serve at a time. Well, being a big Starbucks person, as folks know who work with me, I'm sure hoping that they can actually, um, the takeout can work in that fashion that they're talking about, where you can um, have six right. feet separation, six feet separation and go out the door. That's correct. Um, takeout and delivery, no in, in indoor um, eating. Thing, yeah, or eating. We have a couple of questions uh, related to vaccines and schools. The first is, will teachers and school staff, especially those in schools that are open, be prioritized for the vaccine or will it depend on their age? We do not have details on um, the schools. I know that there have been a number of questions about where the teachers will fall in the priority list. Um, I believe that it will be somewhere in the essential service workers, but we don't have the specific details. And as we mentioned, the vaccines have not been tested in children. So at this point, children will not be, are not on the list of those that will be vaccinated. And uh, do you anticipate using schools for vaccine delivery to students when there is adequate vaccine supply? Um, again, if, if the students are children, they're not on our list for vaccination. But they are, they're, they are looking at, at um, students, at, at kids now, right, Olivia? Um, as far as I know, we, um, we are not prioritizing them, so I don't know, maybe by the time that we get to the general public, but right now, right. the word we've been told is that they're not on the list. Are the age demographics changing for positives? What about race demographics? Are we seeing changes in the demographics of who's affected? Um, there was, a, there was, so now in terms of serious cases, it's still 80 year olds and older than 70 year olds, 60 year olds and 50 year olds. It's very common. Um, it's very consistent. What has changed, at least from initially, is as I think as we've actually tested more asymptomatic people, there are a lot more 20 to 45 year olds now um, who have the virus than we had originally had, at least proportionally. And I think that's partly because of more testing for them. But they're not more serious cases generally. Uh, what is the rate of false positives with the available PCR testing? Zero to 4%. I, I don't have a figure on that. It's, it, I think it's between zero and 4%. I'm not sure. That sounds right. Do you recommend asymptomatics who test positive retest due to fal false positives? Are the case numbers adjusted for false positives? There are only certain situations where we investigate if we and expect that um, a test is false positive. And in situations, yes, if we, the determination is made that it was a false positive, then it, that number will be removed. But generally, I wouldn't retest, right? If they have a test and they think it's false positive, you don't necessarily retest. Not necessarily, no, but it is dependent on the circumstances. Will Sacramento abide by the Supreme Court ruling that our governor cannot treat churches differently than secular institutions like grocery stores? We have not gotten any additional guidance on that. So right now we still have the same um, orders from the state for these institutions. How will I know when it is my turn to get a shot? We will do a lot of um, outreach and um, public outreach, as well as uh, you know, working through uh, different actors such as the healthcare providers. And so we will know when it's uh, time for the general public. And of course, we'll publicize 
the availability of the, uh, the clinics that we set up. So stay tuned. Will rapid testing be more available in coming months? Will it be available for general screening or only for testing symptomatic individuals? Um, rapid testing, are you talking about the antigen tests? So we do have some antigen tests available, but there's still a limited supply. And according to the um, approvals that they got from the FDA, most of the time they, we, you know, we use them in situations where someone has symptoms. So we're still mostly dependent on the PCR tests. Is there any benefit to the immune system from the reduction of stress as a result of the consumption of alcohol? The first part of that question is yes. The second part is probably not really. Certainly reduction in stress in general would be helpful. Yeah, unfortunately alcohol uh, causes a lot of additional problems. So I don't think that it's a good mo mode of uh, reducing stress. Another vaccine question. Do you know whether they are planning to offer or give a vaccine to women who are pregnant? Will a vaccine be available? Oh, just, just that part, I guess. Yeah, we don't know that. How will outreach information about the vaccine be disseminated in limited English populations? Well, we're, we're doing that already in um, Spanish and Hmong and Mandarin and other languages, um, we will absolutely do that. We have money in our, the, mo the money that um, Olivia was able to get from uh, this, the county, the $40 million plus another 30 million or 20 million we got, um, plus more money that should be coming in from the federal government. Some of that, not all of it obviously, but some of that is, is earmarked for um, language specific uh, create, uh, communications. Hey, it looks like we've reached our lightning round. We're going to see how many questions we can squeeze in here. Do you expect the death rate to return to high as earlier this year? Wait, what? Do you expect the death rate to return as high as it was earlier this year? Yes, it already is. I mean, the surge now, with the surge now? Yes, what we usually find is that the death rate, um, the uptick in death rate, there's a delay of about two to three weeks from when the surge starts. So we do expect that there will be an increase in the death rate. There's much about lightning round, Nick. What's that? This isn't much of a lightning round. I know, we really kind of, sorry, I'm trying to read through. Well, why, so, why don't we take one more? Why don't we take one more question? All right. Uh, so what about indoor businesses, activities who have an educational-based license to operate, such as music, dance, martial arts, gymnastics, et cetera? No indoor activities. Okay, with that, I'm going to end with a couple here that are more comments. One from Farah. She says, love Dr. Bielinson's sense of humor. And Melinda notes, I'm sorry to see you go, Dr. Bielinson. I appreciate your very straightforward answers and integrity. Thank you. And let me take this opportunity, if I can, Nick, if you don't mind, and Olivia, um, to say a couple of things. Um, first of all, as some of you may know, I'm leaving in a couple of weeks, and this will be my last uh, one of these presentations. Um, and I, I trust completely uh, Olivia will have uh, has my utmost confidence and will do a phenomenal job of running these things and mostly running the COVID response, which is what she does basically. I just say yes or no to certain things. Um, but I've, been, I've really enjoyed being in Sacramento these past several years, few years. And um, thank you for those of you who have been so kind to us um, over the last uh, two and a half years. And I look forward to seeing how well Olivia does in the future. Thank you. Okay, with that, we'll wrap up. I just want to take a moment to thank both, both Dr. Bjornsson and Dr. Kassiri for sharing your expertise and your time with us this evening. I want to thank all of our interpreters uh, for helping us reach our diverse community here in Sacramento County and thank all of you for your questions. Um, as was mentioned, we'll be doing this again in a couple of weeks. And with that, have a good night.